Hey, hey, welcome to Half the Battle. Well, it's back to the comic this week with Issue 8, Operation Sea Strike. And since it's called Sea Strike, naturally the cover features a jeep being attacked on land. This is the most confusing cover I've seen so far. Whenever I glance at it, I see some sort of aircraft attacking the jeep, while a cobra structure is falling in the background. That's not at all what's going on, the cover is just bad. The issue opens with a small cobra plane coming in to land on a ship. At least that's what I thought at first. The plane is in fact just sitting on the ship. I guess I was expecting a more dynamic image or something. On the ship, Cobra Commander is zeroing in on his target, a space shuttle. And to my delight, they never named the shuttle in the story. Because frankly, the awkward way the comic has been going lately, I have expected it to be the goddamn Challenger. Anyway, due to the fact that Cobra Commander is warned of an approaching aircraft, we learn that this ship doubles as a submarine, as it can move underwater. And meanwhile, we find the Joe team on a training mission... somewhere. Somewhere cold, anyway. And Clutch is being his usual mature self. First by complaining, I want my mommy! And then by throwing snowballs. His antics are mercifully interrupted by Hawk who is dressed surprisingly light for cold weather. There's a good reason for that, though, since the training is happening inside G.I. Joe headquarters, where they appear to have a very ghetto version of the X-Men's danger room to simulate all sorts of environments. Hawk is interrupting the fun because they have a mission. The US is about to launch a satellite that's capable of locating and destroying all of Cobra's hidden sea bases before they even become operational. Hmm, you know, the International Space Treaty forbids weapons of mass destruction to be put in space. Not sure if this thing would qualify. I tried asking NASA, but they were surprisingly unwilling to discuss their orbital death cannons. And now I'm not welcome at Cape Canaveral anymore. Anyway, Cobra knows about this, and the Joes know Cobra knows. And Cobra knows the Joes know they know. Ugh, I need a freaking flowchart to keep up with this. Seriously, freaking Game of Thrones is simpler by comparison. So anyway, the entire G.I. Joe team will guard the space shuttle. We switch to a huge, awesome-looking Cobra underwater base, where Cobra Commander drops more exposition. Their underwater bases, in conjunction with a satellite network, will be able to launch missiles at any target on Earth, once they become operational, that is. Unless, well the military's new satellite might take him out first. And that's why Cobra will launch an all-out assault on the Kennedy Space Center, to take out the shuttle and the satellite with it. As an aside, I'm happy they seem to be toning down the Nazi salutes with this one. Only the Baroness is indulging in it, while the rest of the troops do a different salute. During the commander's monologuing, he has this to say. Failure will not be considered. Will not be tolerated will mean DEATH to those who embrace it. The Joes, meanwhile, arrive at the launch site and begin setting up their defenses. Though honestly, at this point I have to wonder. If you know there's an attack coming, why in the name of Patton's pimp hand don't you send an entire division to bolster the defenses, instead of, you know, 12 guys? Anyway, our 12 soldiers will set up an outer and inner ring of defense and blah blah strategy crap, but that's not the real story here. Flash and Breaker will join the shuttle crew for added security. I have notes. Look, it takes literally years of training to become an astronaut. Even going up as a tourist, something, mind you, that didn't exist at the time this comic was made, would take months of scrutiny and training. And that wouldn't apply here anyway, since we see the Joes go on a freaking spacewalk to place the satellite. Something I'm pretty sure tourists are discouraged from doing. So what they're trying to convince me of is that at least two Joes are qualified astronauts. Just on the off chance they'd have to go into space one day? Credibility gets stretched a bit here. But enough dwelling on that, as Cobra begins the attack. Red alert! They're here and in force! 
They're coming out of the ocean with stuff like we've never seen before. And what is this stuff, you may ask? <laughs> oh, come on! It looks like Ed 209 and Stiltman had a baby! At least this finally explains the cover. The flying thing is really just part of the contraption that's attacking. Those towers are supposed to be its legs. It would have been clearer if the legs had actually been the same color as the cockpit, like in the comic itself. So yeah, these things attack the Joes. They're actually called Sea Legs, where S-E-A stands for Surprise, Engage and Attack. Because practically everything has to be an acronym. Which is kind of funny, considering the name Cobra itself isn't one. A tense battle erupts, but thanks to the great toys and, I mean, military equipment the Joes have, like the tank, jeep and motorcycle, comes with all these accessories, figures may be sold separately, most of the sea legs are destroyed and the rest of them retreat. The day is far from one, though, as this was only the first expendable wave. Cobra Commander sends his amphibious assault guns next. We never get a really full view of them, since they're staying in the tall grass, but basically they're small tanks with a gun on them. At this point, you may have noticed that Cobra has all sorts of strange, sometimes stupid, futuristic vehicles. But none of them show up in the toy line. That's because at this point, Cobra didn't have any vehicle toys. This comic came out at the beginning of 1983. It wasn't until later that year that Cobra finally got some vehicles of their own, namely the now iconic His Tank, the Fang helicopter and a styrofoam glider thing. Because of this, for the first issues of the comic, Marvel had to come up with their own weaponry for Cobra, with mixed success. In this issue, for example, you had the laughable sea legs, but you also had the excellent submersible ship that I'm actually really sorry we never got a toy of. Moving on, the Joes manage to deal with the weird tank gun things. But this leaves the shuttle unprotected, allowing Cobra Commander himself to go in for the kill, using his personal helicopter to fire a missile. All seems lost when Hawk, who's done nothing but stand there the whole battle, fires off a single shot and destroys the missile seconds before the shuttle launches. Cobra Commander says he still has more cards to play, though, and at least one member of G.I. Joe has been burnt to a cinder, since Hawk was right next to the shuttle when it launched. And the thought just occurs to me that, after last issue, you just know Stalker is out there somewhere and he's laughing. But no, Hawk managed to duck into an emergency blast shelter, though I have no idea if those things actually exist, but I doubt it. And he's, of course, fine. Cobra Commander retreats to his undersea base, using the helicopter that's apparently also a submarine, to prepare for the Joe counterattack. And sure enough, the Joes head out on their Aqua Chopper, because they have that now, apparently, and find the Cobra base sitting right there on the surface, waiting for them. As soon as the Joes land on the base, Cobra Commander greets them and launches a missile that will take out the shuttle in orbit, while his troops will wipe out the Joes themselves. But then why didn't he just do that in the first place? Instead of wasting millions in material and personnel on the first attack! Meanwhile... In space... Flash and Breaker are on their spacewalk to put the satellite in orbit. Because you surely don't want trained astronauts or something to handle that sort of thing. No, sir. In a way, they see Cobra's missile approaching. And, in a move that would make Michael Bay say, hmm, that's a bit far-fetched, Flash uses his jetpack to fly to the missile, match its velocity, and then use the power of his backpack to alter the missile's course. And this works! No, just no. You know, I thought that I was reading a G.I. Joe comic. But apparently, I accidentally bought a Buzz Lightyear issue. Look, never mind that spacesuits can't actually do that. At the very least, the explosion should have sent a million pieces of shrapnel, enough to turn Flash, and more importantly, the shuttle itself, into Swiss cheese. 
I'll give this comic a morsel of credit, though, by pointing out that, well, at least they didn't put any sound effect text in space. But let's leave our space rangers and head back to Earth, where the Joes are pressing their attack and, in fact, inflict enough damage to make the Cobra surrender. They've had it, Hawk! I see a white flag! The Joes prepare to enter the base when Cobra Commander gets on the PA again and tells them as he's escaping that the base will blow up in five minutes. You unbelievable idiot! Why would you tell them that? They were going to enter the base! You could have taken out the entire goddamn Joe team, well, except for those two space cadets up there, in one blow! Why couldn't you have just kept your damn mouth shut? So, of course, the Joes hightail it out of there, and prepare to take the Cobras who surrendered with them. But they're having none of it. They say, you can shoot us, but we will not leave. We serve Cobra Commander to the end. We have failed, and will stay to meet our fate. Since there's no time to argue, the Joes get out of dodge, as the Cobra troops get blown up while shouting, Long live Cobra! Wow, so yeah, that just happened. It does raise us some questions, though. First and foremost, if they're that fanatical, then why the hell did they surrender in the first place? Why didn't they fight till the last man? And why did they retreat earlier in those sea leg thingamajigs? It doesn't make sense! Anyway, Cobra Commander still isn't through with the Joes, as he tries to run them over with the escape boat sub thing. Fortunately, the Joes happen to have one bazooka left and blow him the hell up. Only for him to escape in an underwater plane thing that can fly. Seriously, does. Everything Cobra have double as a submarine? And he apparently just pulled this out of his ass because, well, where the hell did it come from? Do you see now why Cobra needed freaking vehicles at this point? And the issue ends with the Joes paddling back to shore as their chopper was destroyed earlier in the fight. So uh, that was codenamed Sea Strike. It, uh, it wasn't very good. The plot stretched credibility to breaking point, especially with the space stuff. The sea legs, well, they looked completely ridiculous. And Cobra's stupidity, especially with Cobra Commander telling his enemies they were about to be blown up, that was uncharacteristic. Well, for the comic, at least. This story would be completely forgettable and, I'd say, avoid it, if it wasn't for one thing. We learned something terrifying about the rank-and-file Cobra troops in this issue. They aren't just mercenaries, they're actually brainwashed fanatics! When you first read the issue, and you come to the part where Cobra Commander is monologuing about failure not being tolerated, you think, well, that's just typical supervillain rhetoric that you've heard so many times before. It isn't until the end of the issue you find out that for his troops, this is serious deadly serious. This makes all the goons we've seen get mowed down so far in the comic not just the enemy, but, in a way, victims themselves of the true enemy, Cobra Commander. It is absolutely chilling and makes him even more sinister than he already was. And considering this sort of thing happens all the time, today, in the real world, where you have warlords in Africa and the Middle East brainwashing kids to go fight, it's actually very grown up for a comic, especially one that's just supposed to sell toys. I just wish that this nugget of profoundness wasn't buried deep inside an otherwise completely crap story with those rejects from War of the Worlds. No, I'm not letting that go. Well, see you next week, everybody. Up good, you did. So anyway, the entire Joe time will guard... The entire Joe time? What the hell? It's very grown up for a comic. Especially the one that's just supposed to sell I'm holding this upside down. 
I'm trying to be sincere and I'm trying to, you know, actually convey a point. And I'm holding the bloody thing upside down.